I would say the people that set and crush their goals versus the people that set goals and it's just a, something on a sheet of paper, uh, the one thing that differentiates them is whether they're purposeful about their goal setting or entrepreneurial about their goal setting. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Byron, host of the Sales and Podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show, where I help you not just hit your sales targets, but really thrive in sales. If you haven't already, make sure you click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Hey there, I'm Jeff Woods, host of The One Thing Podcast and vice president of the company behind the best-selling book, The One Thing. On this episode with Jeff, we're diving into setting goals and actually achieving them. But that sounds like a bit of a boring topic. I promise you it isn't. Jeff blows my mind. I get a little bit confused at first, but I end up going from just setting targets on how many people I want in the sales school, the revenue that I want to generate, the sales targets that I have moving forward to life-changing goals. This is a genuinely epic episode. And with that, let's jump right in. If you had to, gun to head, what would be the one most highest leverage, the one biggest impact thing that separates those that set their targets and crush them every single time, and then those that set them, forget about them a month later, pick them up again because they're in the calendar, realize that they haven't achieved them, and then get upset and drink whiskey and are depressed after the fact. I would say the people that set and crush their goals versus the people that set goals and it's just a, something on a sheet of paper. Uh, the one thing that differentiates them is whether they're purposeful about their goal setting or entrepreneurial about their goal setting. Here's what I mean by this. Um, in the book, The One Thing, one of the three commitments that's required to live an extraordinary life, to achieve extraordinary results is that you commit to moving from E to P, moving from being entrepreneurial to being purposeful. And here's what it looks like for most salespeople out there. They set goals or their goal is handed to them in the form of a quota. And uh, they, they look at it and they go, okay, cool. And then they just go take a bunch of action. That's a disconnect. That's doing it entrepreneurially. It's relying on your natural abilities to figure out how to get it done. Uh, when you act entrepreneurially, you will always have a ceiling of achievement over your head because it's just the best to your ability. The only way you shatter that, is ceil that ceiling and get to the next level, whether you're number one in your organization or just completely shatter everything that's ever been done in that company, is when you move from your natural abilities to following proven models and systems. And when it comes to setting goals, there absolutely are proven models and systems so that you have absolute clarity on what your goals are. And more importantly, the specific measurable time bound activities that you can do that if you just executed on those things would make achieving the goal easier or unnecessary. So I want to get into the anatomy and you kind of give us a couple of pointers there perhaps uh, with the specific and measurable elements of this in a second. But what is the purpose of a goal? Is it simply just to get us to an end result or is there more deeper layers than this? Sure. So I remember I was in a mastermind with my partner. His name's Gary Keller. He started a company called Keller Williams Realty. It's the largest real estate company in the world. Over 180,000 real estate agents are under him. Uh, he looked out at the room and he said, what is the purpose of the goal? And he waited and a bunch of people shouted out answers, most of them having something to do with to achieve a result, which is what I was thinking. And maybe some of you who are listening are like, yeah, the purpose of a goal is to achieve a result. And Gary looked and said, yeah, but not entirely. The purpose of a goal is to be appropriate in the moment, to have a sense of what you want to accomplish in a specific time frame, so that you can determine your actions this exact moment so you are absolutely appropriate with your goals. The purpose of a goal is not to achieve a result, it's to inform the person you can become, to earn the right to achieve those results. Now here's the challenge. When most people set goals, they only ask so big of a question. What can I do this year? And because it's only, it's kind of a small question, they only search, they search pretty shallow for the answer and they end up setting a goal that's doable. It's within their comfort zone, it's within their skill set, it's doable. Will, do you think that's where extraordinary results lies in doing what's just doable? <laughs> well, I, I wanna get, I wanna take this, and clearly no, but I wanna take this and layer it on the, what you talked about at the top of the show and what we're always talking about on the show, smashing sales targets. 
is the sales target that's passed down to you a cor the correct goal to aim towards? Or should we be thinking bigger? Should we be looking at perhaps what the market is actually offering us? Yeah. Would, that be a, would that be a more appropriate goal? Yeah. So let me, let me, let me, let me explain this um, because uh, it'll, it'll tie it together. What is handed down to you may be a doable goal, or it may be out just on the outside of your comfort zone or skill set. It might be a stretch goal. Uh, there's the goal that you set to inform the person you become, which we would encourage you to set a goal that is so big that you're not even sure how it's possible. Because when you think that big, like Elon Musk's, how do I, Elon Musk asked, how do I save the human race? Well, let's put him on Mars. That informed him establishing Tesla, establishing Solar City, establishing SpaceX, because he went so far out there that it required him to shift the type of companies he had to build versus how do I get 10% growth this year? So setting possibility based goals informs who you become. And then there's the goals that you budget against. So your quota is what you budget against. Yet, I've had a quota and said, okay, that's what's doable or what's stretched. But the goals that I'm setting for myself personally is how do I shatter the company record? That's vastly beyond my quota. And it's going to require me to change how I plan. It's going to require me to change my talk tracks. It's going to require me to change my follow-up process. All of these things, because if, I am if I'm shooting for the possibility-based goal, I am so much more likely to blast past the standard quota. And that's when we talk about the difference between the people who crush it versus everyone else. They're not just going for what's doable or even the stretch. They're asking what could be possible and they dare to think bigger than anyone else. Well, let's use that as a inspirational potential thing to work back from here then. Um, and, and tell me if I'm right or wrong here, I assume that we set a ridiculous goal and then we try and work our way back from it. If our goal as a B2B sales professional, perhaps our target is 10 million this year, but someone in the organization four years ago did 100 million, perhaps our goal is then 125 million, whatever, 200 million, whatever the goal is. What's the first thing we do once we've got that right in our brain? Once we go, shit, I don't think I'm actually going to get anywhere near that but Jeff yeah. and Will said I should aim towards it. What's the first step that we do after this? So the first thing we have to reinforce, the purpose of a goal is not to achieve a result. It's to inform the person you can become. So let's use your example, Will. If your quota was 10 mil and you're thinking in the past they did 100, whatever that future possibility number is, is it actually irrelevant. You don't have to boost or anything. The person who earns the right to close $100 million in business in a year, their activities are likely going to be different than the person who closes $10 million. Then they may not even be that different. It might just be subtle tweaks. It might be the type of person that they're calling or the number of hours that they lead generate or whatever that is. What I am saying is when you look at your goals, the first thing I would encourage you to do is ask, what are my goals? Pause the episode. Think about, identify one goal that you have set for yourself for this year. Just one. Get clarity on that. And now I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Is that a goal that is, is it doable? It's within your comfort zone. It's within your skill set. You actually feel like you can do it. If so, we would ask the question, can you think bigger? Maybe that goal is on the outer edge of your comfort zone, but you still think you could possibly hit it. It's a stretch goal. Again, can you think bigger? If you were forced to revise that goal to something that was so big that you weren't even sure it was possible, what might it be? And again, remember, because your, your logical mind's going to be like, but I don't think I can achieve that. The purpose of the goal is not to achieve the result. It's to be appropriate in the moment. There's what you budget against to your manager saying, this is the quote I'm going to deliver. And then there's what you hold yourself accountable in terms of the person that you can become. Because when you focus on becoming the type of person who can achieve, quote, the impossible, you end up shattering what everybody else thinks is ordinary. Okay, so two things on this. One, what, again, in that example, perhaps, are we going to write, if we were to write the goal down, stick it on a post-it note, back to front on our forehead so we see it every time we look in the mirror. What would that 
goal be? I'm 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 hesitant to use the word goal now because um, there's the kind of multiple levels to this. But for, for want of a better word, what would that goal perhaps be? And then mm -hmm. what would we be doing to become the person that would achieve or or smash Bingo. that goal? Bingo. I'll use an example. Um, I'll use real estate as an example just because I see so many agents by being inside the Keller Williams ecosystem. You have a lot of people that maybe they think they could sell 10 or 15 houses a year, right? And we simply ask the question, okay, if you feel like you can do 10 or 15 houses a year, what would it take to do 100? And their mind immediately, like they start shutting down and they're like, how could I possibly do that? But the <laughs> truth is, I know I have personal friends who sell thousands of homes a year. They just have different models and systems, right? So by asking a bigger question, like taking your production from 10 houses a year to 100, 10x the production, it is possible to do and it is going to require you to act differently. Suddenly you are no longer succeeding as an individual agent. You are hiring a team. You have an administrative assistant. You might have another agent that works under you. Instead of just recruiting for sales, you might be recruiting for people, leverage. There's always ways to accomplish higher results. It's just going to require different activities. So when we ask these bigger questions, most people don't have the immediate answer. This is where the growth is. That's when you pause and you search for the answer. Instead of just getting distracted and be like, no, I don't know. So I'm going to go check email because that's where <laughs> extraordinary results lies. <laughs> and, and what does this look like practically? Because I know there's going to be yeah. a good chunk of the audience brains who are getting blown here. And it might be for a lot of them, maybe I need to change careers, jobs, positions to there's a cap on my earnings. Hopefully there isn't because that's the worst thing in sales. If you're in a job where there is a cap and it isn't, four million quid, then you need to change role immediately on that front. But for people who are going, okay, right, I need to rethink all this. I need to rethink my strategy, my position. Um, we talked about it on the show. Salespeople should have some kind of assistant. Salespeople should have someone help manage their emails. That's a waste of their time, most uh, typically for most high, uh, high value B2B sales professionals who are doing high deal sizes. So what does all this look like practically? Is this a exercise where we have to create a goal that scares us, that puts us our brains out of the window and then we sit down with a pad of paper for a couple of hours and jot down how we could potentially change the game how we could model people we could find who've got systems that we can copy employ whatever is is that what we need to do is that the second step on yeah. this so, so so let's make this just really really tactical we're going to think big about being the type of people who set possibility based goals and shatter everything that we know to be true today and let's start by going really small i want you to think of one goal that you have set for yourself this year. Really get clarity on it to the point that you could write it down. And I would encourage you, if you're not driving, to actually write down the goal and stare at it and ask the question, is this a doable goal? Meaning it's already, it's not gonna require me to change. I can do this. Is it a stretch goal? Meaning it's on that outer level, it's, I, but I could probably do it. Or is it a possibility-based goal? Meaning it's going to require you to evolve who you are as a person to achieve that result. Get clarity on that first. Step one, write it down. Step two, declare whether it's a doable, stretch, or possibility-based goal. And most people, because we've asked this to over 10,000 people, most people are not setting possibility-based goals. We would just ask the question, how do you make it so big that it scares you? And rewrite it. And once you've rewritten it, ask this question. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it would make achieving this goal easier or unnecessary? What's the one thing? Not two things, not three things. One thing you can do. Not you'll feel guilty if you don't do it. You actually can do it such that by doing it consistently over time would make achieving that big goal easier or completely unnecessary? That is a big question. The mistake would be to ask it to yourself, realize you're drawing a blank and move on. Sit with it, explore it, revisit it. That is how you begin to become the type of person who achieves extraordinary results. What time frame should we be looking at to achieve 
something extraordinary? Is this, well, before Christmas in three months from now, I want to be a multimillionaire and I'm sat on my friend's sofa right now with some crappy sales job and I'm struggling. Is three months the time frame? Are we looking at a year? Are we looking at five years? Kind of going at the, you've interviewed and gone through this process with so many people. Yeah. How long does it take in the real world for this to happen? So again, and I love that you asked this question, Will, because it just goes to show how tightly in our cultures we believe that the purpose of a goal is to achieve a result. It's not about how long it takes. It's about who do you become along the way. I'll give you a perfect example. When I was in medical sales, I remember having my best year I'd ever had. I shattered the company record. I earned President's Club, got all the trophies and the plaques, had a great income year. And I remember looking up and saying, that's great. And I want to be able to earn 10x this passively. Meaning I don't have to make the sales calls to earn this. And I remember asking, well, how can I do that? And I, my mind just immediately was drawing blanks because I'm going, well, how could I possibly sell that much? It required me to go on a journey to explore opportunities outside of that particular compensation structure. I needed to be a business owner. I needed to have equity. But had I not asked that question, I likely would have kept slinging medical devices year after year after year, making an, a, a good income, but never realizing my potential. And because I asked a bigger question that I didn't have an immediate answer to, it made me realize that I wasn't the type of person who even knew how to start a business, which led me to discover that Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you set, spend the most time with. And I said, well, how do I become the type of person who can attract world-class mentors into my life? So I went on a journey to upgrade my five, which inspired me to start my first podcast, which is how I got in touch with Jay, who co-authored The One Thing with Gary Keller. And because I was, like, this whole domino thing unfolded to the point that you now fast forward and I run the whole company behind their book. But it was because one day I set a bigger goal, a goal that I had no clue how it would be possible to achieve. And I sat there and I asked the question, what's one thing I can do such that by doing it would make upgrading my five easier or unnecessary, would make starting a business easier or unnecessary, would make building passive income easier or unnecessary. And it just has evolved along the way. So is, because I feel like I'm focusing on, because I'm trying to be practical, probably too practical, is focusing on sales targets, being the best salesperson in the company, is that too, is that always too small of a goal? Should we be thinking backwards from where you were, Jeff, of what lifestyle do I want to achieve? And then working backwards from that. Ah, there you go. What does an amazing professional life, you know, this is a great question for people to ask. Will, can I use you as a guinea pig? Of course you can. Okay. Will, um, I want us to do a little time traveling. And I want you to imagine we fast forward five years and you and I happen to run into each other in uh, the Heathrow airport. And I see you and I go, Will Barron, how the <laughs> heck are you, man? And you're like, Jeff, you would not believe it. My professional world is amazing. What does your professional life look like five years from now to the point that in your bones with the most enthusiasm and confidence you could possibly muster, it is amazing. What does that look like? So- I think I can paint a pretty good picture of this because this is something that I do ponder on. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to what I was just about to, what I was hesitant to say in a second, and it, it was timeframes. But so two things, one, well, multiple things, but two projects, essentially. The sales school, on one hand, uh, my goal is 2,500 members, which is about £100,000 revenue a month. Um, I also want to- How many members? How many members? Two and a half thousand. There's about 200 in there at the moment from kind of uh, 40 days of, uh, of of it being open. Um, and, and that's the revenue generator. That's the kind of the, the value that to the business world. That's the, the bread and butter of the business. On the flip side of the business, um, I, we may have touched on this. I've talked about it on the show before, but I also host a podcast called Excited Science. This is what I'm real passionate about. This is what I want to do for the next- 30, 40 years um, until I'm too old to be podcasting or whatever the medium turns into where I interview 
essentially in a nutshell, I interview real awesome, um, charismatic. Oh, was that thunder or so on? Yeah, dude. <laughs> That's a sign. You saw me, it's a you sign. Saw me jump. <laughs> For everyone who's not watching the video, Jeff just literally jumped out of his seat. That was amazing. That's going to be a clip on itself to promote this episode. So, anyway, on, on the flip side of things, Excited Science, I interview really interesting, charismatic scientists, and they try and get me excited about science so I can get the audience excited about science as well. It's a right laugh. Uh, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. And I dumb down the science so that it's understandable uh, for everyone listening. This all hosted from a small office with a small team, a manageable team, video editor, a couple of writers, um, and a, an audio editor. That's the five-year goal. That's the five-year plan. Okay. This is going to be awesome because now we actually get to make something tangible. So I hear two sides of this. There's the, the business behind the Salesman podcast, and then there's your excited science, which yep. is what you're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. If the Salesman business and the podcast could continue to thrive without you, meaning you replaced yourself so that you could just focus on excited science, would you do it? Yes and no. With the sales school content, I'd love to hire someone who can, because a writer writes most of it, I review it, and then I present it on the workshops that we're doing. But it doesn't necessarily need to be, it could be any good presenter would be able to present and get the message across and do the teaching as well, if not better than myself. The podcasting, I like, because I do like the uh, entrepreneurship. I do like the sales training that I'm learning from people like yourself. So I'd probably continue to do the podcast, the salesman podcast. I continue to do Excited Science podcast and content there but I would hire someone to help out with the sales school content. Okay. So here's, um, I, I wanted to get clarity on that because I didn't want to push a vision on you. I wanted to get your vision. I heard 2,500 members in five years. Does that feel doable? Does that feel stretch or does that feel possible? That is doable. Okay. So here's a perfect example. When I asked you what amazing looks like, you gave me a doable answer. Will, what would you have to do? What's one thing you could do such that by doing it five years from now, you'd have 50,000 people in the salesman school instead of 2,500? Um, nothing different, Jeff, because what I'm learning and having some success with now is uh, paid acquisition, paid traffic going into a, a funnel of just a ton of value, which then people buy the sales school or register the sales school. And there'll be people listening to this who've been through it, come out of the other end. So and then let, let me let me just, because um, you, you can help me out here perhaps. And perhaps it's not the effort, it's not the amount of paid traffic, it's not the skill set of that. It's the fact that if the business is generating 100 grand a year, that would fund the lifestyle that, and this is perhaps the hang up, that I'd be comfortable with versus a lifestyle that would be even just completely ridiculous, if that makes sense. So maybe it's not oh. the number of people in the sales school. It's the fact that there's a hundred grand, you know, million plus pound a year uh, business. That's probably where I'm aiming towards, whereas it's not necessarily that that's the hang up. It's the fact that I'm looking for a comfortable lifestyle. If that makes sense. So what you just went to is your financial thermostat. And as salespeople, we all have this. There is a, just like a thermostat in your house, you set it to, I'm in, I'm in the US, so 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it dips a few degrees low, the heater kicks on. And if it goes a few degrees above, the AC kicks on and it kind of keeps it within that range. Every single one of us has a financial thermostat where if we're making below that amount, we're going to make a change because we know we're worth more. And also, if we start to think about making a lot more than that, our mind starts to self-sabotage. And and that is exactly what's happening here. And you can hopefully help me and the audience with mm -hmm. this as well. But the cell, and, and it's totally subtle, but the self-sabotage that perhaps comes from this is, well, I'm, I, I love what I'm doing right now. <laughs> my As well as the, the wealth thermostat, my happiness thermostat is probably a good, you know, seven, eight, not nine on occasion, probably not 10 right yet, because I know that there's things that need to be done to, to that I can do right now to improve it. But I'm pretty damn happy. And I know that once I get to that next level, because then we're talking about not GTRs, we're talking about Ferraris, we're not talking about holidays to Greece, we're talking about holidays to wherever the, the feck you want at that point. And I, I feel like that is the comfortable zone, if that makes sense. Mm. And so, so that's what's holding me back on that front. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And this is why 
the goal is less about the result and more about who you become along the way, Will. Because when I look at that, this conversation right here, for me, illuminates that you have an opportunity to have a conversation with yourself about what does that life look like that you actually want to live? Because when you started talking about making more money, the thing that you started talking about was nicer houses or trips, material objects. Yet when I sit down with my partner, Gary, who's the wealthiest man that I know, and somebody asked him, when is enough money enough? And he told a story of his wife, Mary, and she was traveling and she came across a young artist who was just incredibly talented. And these were not excuses, but very legitimately, the single thing that was holding him back from greatness was a lack of funds. And she whipped out her checkbook and she wrote him a check that would make most people's heads spin. And he said, you have to understand for us, that was a rounding error. He said, when you money does, um, is not good or bad, it simply, it simply reveals you. It just reveals who you really are. If you're a good person, it's going to amplify that. If you're, a, if you're not a good person, if you're a selfish person, it will reveal you. If you are a generous person who wants to leave a legacy, you will come to realize that there is no amount of money that is ever enough because it's simply a vehicle for impact. So when I look at somebody like you, Will, you probably have an opportunity to do some daydreaming about what does extraordinary really look like for you 20, 30 years from now? Because when you start talking about, I don't know if you want to have kids or um, at some point you're going to want to start talking about leaving a legacy where it's not about you being the host of the show, but you might get more value from coaching somebody and watching them stepping into the limelight. Well, I'll tell you what came into my head. And sorry to interrupt you, but I I don't want to lose my train of thought as you said that. With the science side of things, if there was relative unlimited cash, then you'd be, or I would be looking at, well, what research could I fund that would do X, Y, Z? Which is, which is, I I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm too far off the right tracks of, you know, 100 grand, which would be 50, 60 grand a month, minimum kind of cash in pocket before tax. I I've, I don't have aspirations. I've I've got a nice big kind of five bedroom house. I've got this flat three bedroom flat as well. I've got a nice BMW. The GTR I could probably buy right now if I wanted to for whatever for marketing purposes or storytelling purposes. The more and this is the trigger that you set off in my head and I wrote it down here. The the generous side of things that changes the whole conversation of I don't want to just write a book on how to sell and hopefully that helps people being able to have the cash to even just do research into what actually helps in the world of sales and business, genuine scientific research in that versus all the bullshit that all these gurus and experts come out with that is anecdotal. Even that from the sales side of things would be really powerful and useful for the audience and would leave a legacy, but perhaps even more so on the science side of things, not talking about, maybe this is what I should be talking about. I held myself back then, which is interesting. Perhaps not even, so my mum passed away from breast cancer a couple of years ago, but perhaps not even, again, holding myself back, not even diving into uh, curing cancer, but because that, that is almost unlimited money. Maybe that should be the goal, something along those lines. Because that's is it then, unlimited? Is it unlimited? No, it's a finite number. Yeah. There is a finite number that is required. But let, let, me, let, me, let me connect the dots for the people who are listening to this. What everybody who listened is starting to see two dots get connected. Your goal shifted from how do I go from where I am today to 2,500 members in the sales school to how do I build a business that could fund the scientific research to solve major problems in the world? One is a doable goal. (laughs) One is a possible goal. The reason, and the reason that's important is because, Will, you just brought purpose into it. Because now when you have purpose, there is a reason why you do what you do. And when things get hard when it comes to achieving goals, which we haven't even talked about the accountability side, what happens when you fall behind your goal? It's halfway through the year and you're not at least halfway towards your goal. What do you do? Most people say, I'll do better next year. No, 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 no. You now have purpose brought into this. There is a commitment to that vision and you make a commitment to changing your activities so you make up the gap. 
on those. This is why it's so much less about achieving the result and more about who you become. Because when you think bigger, you begin to get more motivation, more purpose, more clarity, and true commitment, which is what most people lack toward their goals. Well, I want to, we, we, if the audience, if you enjoy this and you enjoy me kind of having my mind broken live on a, drop me an email, but we'll, we'll pull that away from me just for a second in case, uh, in case people aren't getting anything out of that. And I want to drag it back to, because we, we, at the top of the show, we touched on this, but what a goal needs to be from the, there's the smart acronym. There's tons of other acronyms on this. And we'll wrap up with this, Jeff, with this Jeff. What does a goal need to be, uh, whether it's you know specific, measurable? What, what do we need to do on paper to, what do we need to do? Let me, this is a better way of asking the question. What do we need to do to increase our chances of potentially hitting it or yeah. smashing it? So, so whether in this, we got a lot of experience, whether we're going into corporations and helping them do this, or whether we're doing it with individuals through online training, the biggest mistakes we see, number one is that people write their goals as a result. I want to sell this much. I want to close this much business. The challenge is when you wake up, you don't ask, what are my results today? You ask, what should I be doing? We don't think in the language of results. We think in the language of activities. Your goals must be written as activities that specifically highlight what needs to be done to achieve the result. So you might want to close 100 grand or 10. We'll go with that 10 million you did earlier. My question would be, you probably have to go on appointments to close the deals. And to get appointments, you have to make phone calls. How many calls do you have to make to close that much business? Because when you convert the result to the activity, you know what your gap is at any single moment in time. I would start there. When you look at your goals, ask, are these results based or are they activity based? based and get them to the point that they reflect the activities that you can do that would achieve the result. That is huge. And I know you've got a product which might cover some of this, but how yeah. do we plan all of this out? Is this something that we wake up each day and say, well, right, I'm one step closer than I was yesterday. What activities do I need to do now? Or is this, what do I need to be done? What needs to be done this month, this year, this decade, so that yeah. I can go and cure all these incredible diseases now that you've got me on this track? <laughs> So my partner, Jay, looked at me one day and he asked, do you know how billionaires set goals? And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, no, but I sat down <laughs> as quick as I could at his desk. I was like, I am ready to take notes, baby. <laughs> uh, most of us set goals the wrong way. We set goals by looking forward and we ask, what can we do this year? The challenge is if I asked you to just think back over your life as to how you got here today, you might be like, well, I pressed play on this episode. And before that, I realized I was a little bit bored or I was looking for some stimulus. So I decided to listen to a podcast. And before that, I woke up this morning. And before that, I decided to get in sales. And before that, I was in school. When you imagine your life looking backwards, it's a straight line. Challenge is when you look forward at what's possible for you in your lifetime, um, you see all the things that you could do. And when you ask, like, what could I accomplish over the next year? You see that those options laid out in front of you, but you're only seeing part of the scope. Because if you cascade each of those lines out over time, it's kind of like a plane flying from Los Angeles to the UK. If you're a few degrees off course and you don't correct, you end up on a different continent. When you set goals only looking forward, um, you don't know what a distraction is from a true priority. And what billionaires do is they time travel. They go someday into the future and ask, what do I actually want out of life? Like, Will, you just, you got some of that today. And once they have a sense of what they want someday from now, they ask, where do I need to be five years from now to feel like I'm on track for my someday? And once they get clarity on what five years looks like, they ask, what do I, what can I do this year to feel like I'm on track for the five? This is the easy part. Once you got your one year, you identify what your priorities are for the month. And once you know your priorities for the month, you know your priorities for the week. And then you know what should be on your calendar or your planner. The challenge is most people's calendars or planners don't reflect their priorities. They reflect the noise, everyone else's work, meetings with other people that don't actually move the needle. What if your calendar actually reflected your true priorities and only that? What would change? That's how this all begins. And perhaps we can talk about time blocking and perhaps that fits yeah. into the conversation here. But what does that look like on your diary, Jeff, uh, your calendar every 
kind of day, week, month, what is blocked in there that no one else can uh, abrupt change or, or kind of drag your attention away from? So this is part of it is when we, because we were wrestled with this personally, um, our digital calendars were a disruption. You know, if you pick any random day on your digital calendar, and if we asked you to tell us what your one thing was for that day, the single thing that was most important, most people cannot tell us because their calendars weren't designed for that. And so we invented, we reinvented the paper planner this year. It's called the one thing planner. And it is there to highlight your priorities, not the noise, not all the little meetings, the things that matter most. And so the things that go on that for me are, um, number one, thinking time, time blocked and protected for me to think because most people wake up and just run through walls, ask, what should <laughs> I do today? And they draw a blank. So they start checking email and then they just reacting to everybody else's priorities and never advancing their own. I have time set where I sit down and I ask myself deadly questions. Where might I be accidentally undermining my success? What's one thing I'm not doing that if I started doing immediately would 10x my results? What's one thing I could do so that no customer would ever need to leave us again? Who am I missing in my world? Where is there leverage that I'm currently not taking advantage of? And I sit there and I answer these questions and it shapes my entire agenda. That's there. Um, time with talent, recruiting talent, whether it be internally, um, developing relationships with people inside my organization or externally, people that I'm missing in my world. Um, time that is blocked is planning time. Time for me to plan my vacation time. These are the first things that get blocked off. Lead gen time, time to generate leads for our business. And that's the stuff that goes first. And if there's something else that's already scheduled, it's a distraction and it has to interview to keep its spot. Do you have, because it seems to be a recurring theme, you come up with some great ones seemingly off the top of your head. Do you have either a list of, you call them deadly questions that we can view, download, or do you have, and if you don't, you should definitely have something along the lines of this, a email sequence, a newsletter where every day at nine o'clock, we get a question that we should ponder on for 10, 15 <laughs> minutes. Do you have anything along the lines of this? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Because <laughs> um, I genuinely don't know. <laughs> I'm asking the, that the, for the, my the, own benefit. The, 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 the first is in the planner, in the one thing planner. The purpose of this planner was not for people to have a place to park their to-dos. It was to teach people how to think so that they actually are masters of their time. And on each page is a deadly question for you to think about. And we ask, um, because we don't just plan our time at the end of each month, we have a reflect and plan. And there are specific questions we ask on a monthly basis to ensure that we're achieving extraordinary results. And at the end of each quarter, there's a quarterly reflect and plan, which is much more geared to where are you in relation to your goals? What's your gap? How do you start changing things up differently? There's an annual reflect and plan. These are the, this is legitimately how we operate behind the scenes. And this is how we teach people to operate. And the second is if you guys go to the one thing, which number one, go to the one thing.com slash planner. If you want to learn about the planner, that's what the number one in the URL, or you can just go to the one thing.com. And if you click on free stuff, um, there is a kick ass guide to asking deadly questions that you can download as well with some of our favorites. And many of those ended up going in the planner. Perfect. <laughs> I, I genuinely didn't know that. So I appreciate the URLs. Yeah. I'll link them in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.org forward slash Jeff blows minds. No spaces. <laughs> That'll be the show notes for this episode. And with that, Jeff, are I've got you, one. Are you serious? Yeah, man, th this is, <laughs> I, I, I won't dive on about this because this is something that's come up in a few episodes now. I get so much more clicks, traffic, attention, the audience clicking on show notes when there is a ridiculous um, episode title, oh, not episode title, episode uh, kind of show notes URL. I'll give you a more formal, appropriate one if you want to share the episode. No, but I yeah. like Jeff Blows Jeff Minds. Jeff Blows spelling, Minds. Are you, spelling, are you spelling it G-E-O-F-F -F or J-E-F-F -F, or are you doing both? Um, uh, G. You spell your name G, don't you? G-E-O-F-F. -F. It's British. I just didn't get the accent like you or I would have done much better on the lodge. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, don't, don't know about that. No one seems to understand me when I'm speaking, <laughs> uh, especially to our international audience. But with that, Jeff, I've got one final question, mate. Something I've asked you a bunch of times, something I've asked a load of people that's come on the show, and that is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling that has nothing to do with goals? Yeah. 
Um, it's a quote in the one thing from FM Alexander. People do not decide their futures. They decide their habits. And their habits decide their futures. And this very much ties together everything we've talked about today. If the purpose of a goal is not to achieve a result, but rather to inform the type of person you can become so you're appropriate in the moment, what are the habits that you can acquire today such that by acquiring them would make achieving those future possibility goals easier or unnecessary? And I would tell myself, instead of worrying about how I go about achieving my goals or the results, how do I be the type of person who thinks really big about my goals and then goes really small, acquiring one power habit at a time over time? to lead to that extraordinary results. Amazing stuff. Well, Jeff, you shared a couple of links with us already, but where can we find out more about you, uh, the book, uh, you mentioned the planner, uh, but the events as well that you're putting on? Yeah, so first and foremost is the One Thing Podcast. You guys are already listening to podcasts. I would strongly suggest going there because um, this is a lifelong journey and hearing the stories and hearing the language of extraordinary results, you just got to get it into your mind. Uh, the One Thing Planner, the one thing.com slash planner. You can learn all about all our other trainings and stuff. And we do um, host a live goal setting retreat every year. You can, if you click on the training page, you'll see it there. We also have an online course of it where we really break this all down for you. Perfect. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes. And with that, Jeff, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you selfishly for putting some food for thought in my head yet again. Every time I speak to you, the game changes and makes it more... It, two weeks of stress as I try and ponder all this and think it out. So I appreciate that for wiping out my diary for the next couple of weeks as I think about it all. And with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time, of course, your expertise, and for joining us again on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, Will. It's my pleasure. 